I just want to take this opportunity to welcome Mike, Mike Williams. Mike has, uh, has led our service once before, and uh, we're really, really grateful that he has agreed to come back and lead us this morning. Mike is from Little Over Methodist Church, and uh, we're really grateful to you, Mike, and uh, we're really looking forward to what Mike has to share with us and what God has to say through Mike this morning. So thank you, Mike. That's lovely. It's the first time I've spoken in front of a live congregation since Christmas Day. Um, although, uh, so, yeah, people move. <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for your welcome, Mary. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed when I came last time. I'm glad I passed the test to get invited back. That's always, that's always quite reassuring. And I thought we'd start this morning with Psalm 95. Just an opening call of worship. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Now we can't sing still hopefully the day is coming when we will be allowed to do so but we can sing in our hearts you can join in by absorbing the words and what god really wants as we come into his presence this morning is hearts that are just focused on him and willing to give him our worship it may be silent but he sees our hearts he sees our desires he sees what we're thinking and I pray that our opening song will just help us to give thanks to God for all that he does to us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, 10,000 reasons for my heart to sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that we can come and we can meet together in your presence this morning. Father, we thank you for your promise to us that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you will be there. And we reach out to you this morning because we want to say thank you for all that you have done and all that you continue to do day by day in our lives. Just two weeks ago, we will have sung your praise on Easter Sunday, in our hearts at least. We will have recognised the wonder of that moment when you rose from the dead, when our sins were forgiven. You set us free to be the people that you truly want us to be. And we thank you that that wasn't a one-off event, but it's a daily experience for those who walk with you. And we ask and we pray that as we come here this morning, you will challenge us about our relationship with you and you will help us to hear your voice and to respond to your call. Father, we know that there are many things that we do which unfortunately fall outside of your standards and your expectations for us. And at the beginning of our time, we want to say sorry for those things that we do, which have upset you, upset others with whom we work, with whom we live, with whom we live nearby, who we come into contact with. There are things that we could have done that we've left undone. But we thank you that when we bring them before you, you promise to forgive. You promise to wash our sins away and make us whiter than snow. So come, Lord Jesus, this morning with the restoring power of the Holy Spirit. Renew us, refresh us, and equip us again to be your people, able to serve you in this place and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because we cannot sing, I like to try and think of other ways that we can kind of reach out to God as an act of worship and perhaps just see um, uh, and reflect on something in this instance of his character to us. And so Mary's going to run through a very, very simple PowerPoint, which I put together. Well, actually, my wife put together, to be fair, to give the credit where it's due. And um, it just focuses on God's love for us. Such a simple thing and yet actually such a profound thing and I just wonder if we can if we can look at it now one of the things I'm going to say to you is if you ever want to go and listen to this service again uh, or want to look at this bit this will probably look better on the internet later than it does here in church just because the colors are more vibrant on the um, on the images when you see it online than you will on here but just look at these words and look at some of these pictures and just think about God's love for you, for us, is extravagant. God's love is extravagant. The detail in that flower is incredible and vibrant. Let's look at the next one. And the, the next images will all be verses from the Bible. And it says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. It doesn't just come 
mealy in a, in a meaningless small way, but it's lavished on us. God loves you so much. And that word lavished just impresses upon us how much and how costly God's love was, but he held nothing back from us. Let's look at the next one. There is nothing, and the nothing is in different type because I want you to really think about that. There is nothing in all creation that is able to separate us from the love of God. You've read that verse probably hundreds of times. Some of you have been Christians for many, many years. But do we live as people that really believe that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God? Nothing at all. Let's have a look at the next one. God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The story of Easter encapsulated on a cross brought to life by the empty tomb, done so that our sins could be forgiven. And the next one picks up similarly. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He reached out through his one and only son on that cross holding nothing back and then finally and probably my favorite image of all of them and pleasingly it probably comes out as well on there as any of them do a picture of a waterfall if it were a video that waterfall would just be running there would be a constant flow of water going over that waterfall. And it reminds us that God's love couldn't run out. His merciful love couldn't dry up. His love and his mercies are created new every morning. Slightly different version of a that famous verse from Lamentations. But just concentrate on that flowing water and that image of God's constant love flowing out to you and to me. Father, thank you that your love is a constant. Thank you that we can depend upon it and thank you that as that image shows it never runs out thank you lord now somebody is going to come and read the bible to us we're going to have a reading from acts chapter 9 i'm going to say before the not sure who the lady is that's coming. Um, looks like somebody's moving. Um, yeah, there we are. Right. Um, this is like half a story, and it's deliberately only half a story. But the first half of the story is the really exciting bit, and I've left that out. So you'll have to work out why when we get to the sermon. But the first bit is the very famous story of the conversion of Saul on the Damascus Road where he sees the Lord and the light comes and he's blinded. And what happens next is the bit that we're going to pick up on. And we're going to see something about a man called Ananias. Thank you. The reading is taken from Acts, chapter 9, verses 10 to 19. 
In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptised, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Here ends the lesson. Thank you. We'll come back and consider that in a few moments, but we're going to pray again. Uh, So let's turn to a short time of intercession. Father, I do want to thank you for this church family. And Lord, I thank you for the the way that you have been at work in this place over the last few years. Thank you for the enthusiasm for the work that's going on. Thank you for the redevelopment and for the new opportunities that have happened as a result of the work that have gone on here. And thank you for the evidence of growth, both numerical and spiritual, in the life of the church. Father, we want to pray for Mary in particular, as she seeks to lead so much of what goes on here. Lord, we pray that you would reach out and encourage her and help her to have clarity of purpose in what she does, what she recognises you are calling her and this church to do. And I pray, Lord, that others who are here will listen and assist and help and encourage the work to move forward. Father, we thank you for Leanne and all that she does in reaching out and seeking to meet the needs of people in this area. Lord, we pray that you would bless her in her work. And again, Lord, we pray that you would encourage both her and Mary as they see you at work in the lives of people to whom they come into contact. Lord, I thank you for the individuals in this church that you know about. And Lord, we pray particularly for Elaine, who uh, needs to go back into hospital this week for another operation on her elbow. Lord, I pray that you will guide those that treat her, that you will help the surgeons, the nurses, and all those who are involved in her care to be able to get that elbow functioning again. And Lord, we just pray that you will enable her to be well and restored to full health. Lord, finally, I I just simply want to continue to pray for our royal family. Some of us will have watched the funeral yesterday And Lord, we recognise that 
um, Prince Philip was much loved and much respected by many of the people that he came into contact with. Lord, we pray that you will help the Queen as she continues to mourn his loss. And we pray for other members of the family as they seek to step up and fill that void and help her to be able to continue to be that servant of the nation. And Lord, finally, I, I pray for uh, the continued battle against coronavirus in this country and the wider world. Lord, we thank you that there seems to have been such progress in recent weeks. And Lord, we just pray that you will help our government and those in authority over us to make wise decisions as they seek to open up more things over the coming weeks and months as we seek to return to something nearer to normality. Lord, we pray that we will be responsible as individuals in how we take that newfound freedom. And we pray, Lord, that you will help the, uh, the government to make the right decisions at the right time so that as many people as possible can be kept safe, but also uh, businesses can get back to doing what they need to do and individuals can engage with others to uh, help restore and reunite family groups and friendships and all those sorts of things that in some ways have been put on hold over the last few months. So Lord, be at work, we pray. Hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to listen to another song. And it's a, a real song of Easter triumph. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
So I deliberately chose a passage this morning from Acts because I felt this was something that uh, was a message that God put on my heart for you uh, as something that you could all uh, listen to and weigh up and see if there was something here that he had for you as individuals and as a fellowship. The exciting thing about Acts is that it's a book that tells stories. A lot of the New Testament has got teaching about um, different aspects of how to be a Christian and what it means to be a Christian. The Acts of the Apostles gets into some practical stuff. We see how the church started, the church developed, the church grew, how people responded and acted themselves in response to God's call on their lives. And Acts is full of stories. Some people call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because some of the stories are truly remarkable. And the story that we kind of glossed over at the beginning of this chapter, the conversion of Saul, is one of those miracles because basically you have a man who wanted to persecute the church and his life is turned around by meeting the risen Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. An amazing encounter for him with God, with life-changing consequences. But I don't want us to focus on that end of the story. I want us to focus on the little man, Ananias. Ananias hardly crops up in the Bible at all, and yet he plays a really important part in that conversion story of Saul. And that's why I want us to look at him rather than the first bit where we can all get excited about the work of God in Saul's life. Do you know there was a story that I heard once about uh, from America about a telegraph office. Now before we had the internet and before we had telephones the only way you could send messages long distance was using Morse code and there were telegraph offices dotted all over America to receive and send these messages. And a man responded to a job advert in a telegraph office as a Morse code operator. And the man arrives at the office and it was very, very busy, lots of noise, lots of chatter, lots of messages were being sent. You can imagine the sort of noise that was going on. And he joined a group of other people who'd come for the same interview in a room. There was a sign on the receptionist's desk that said, fill out a form, and wait to be summoned to the inner office. After a few minutes, this young man got up from his seat and he walked straight into the inner office. The other applicants muttered, what's he doing? We've not had any call yet. Within a few minutes, the employer escorted this young man out of the office and addressed the other applicants. Thank you so much for coming, but the job has been filled. You can imagine, there was grumbling, there was moaning. And eventually somebody stood up and said, he was the last to come in and we never got a chance to be interviewed. Yet he got the job. It's not fair. The employer said for the last several minutes, while you've been sitting here, the telegraph has been ticking out the following message in Morse code. If you understand this message, come right in. The job is yours. None of you heard or understood this, but the young man did. The job is his. Do you know, we are so busy sometimes living in a world that's full of noise and full of clatter, just like that office, we get distracted. We are unable to hear the still small voice of God as he speaks in creation through the scriptures 
and in our life through the work of Jesus. And it's that aspect of responding to God's call that I want us to look at this morning through this story of Ananias. Those of you who've heard me speak before will know that I am not a deep, meaningful preacher. I do not go into the theology of things. That is for others. I admire them, but it's not for me. I uh, like to get to the simple stuff. Uh, I see something in a story and I want to just talk to you about what I see as the simple truths that we can pick up from this story. So I'm going to give you some very, I hope, simple but maybe practical and thought-provoking things from here this morning. First of all, if we're going to respond to God's call, then we actually need to be aware of God's presence in our lives. If you're a Christian here this morning, you will have you recognise that God has reached out to you through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrated it on Easter Sunday and he's invited you into a brand new relationship and promises the presence of his Holy Spirit into the core of your life. Now the Spirit of God with you and in you provides you with the fruits and the gifts to carry out God's plan for your life. Just think and stop for a minute. That Holy Spirit being in your life is having God there with you all the time. I think we sometimes forget that as Christians. But one of the gifts that God gives us is the presence of his spirit. And that means there is a part of God that is with us all the time. That is profound and that is precious. And often we ignore it. So whenever we seek to understand what God may be calling us to do, we must first understand who we are in him. We are precious. We've been called. We have his presence within us. There's a very famous verse from Jeremiah chapter 29, regularly quoted. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God wants the best for each of us and he does have a plan for each of our lives. We need to dwell in his presence and to hear and work out what that plan is for each one of us. Ananias in this story was a disciple. He knew that he was a Christian. And the Lord called to him in verse 10 in a vision. And he answered, very simple. But Ananias was kind of in that place where he knew that God could speak to him. And he knew to recognize that voice when it spoke. So the second thing we need to consider is that we need to give God time so that we can listen to him, to weigh up what he said and to respond to what he said. In verses 13 and 14 that we read, Ananias answered in what I think is an incredibly honest way. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. 
In other words, Ananias is expressing doubts about what he was being asked to do. And why not? I have absolutely no problem with the fact that Ananias entered into dialogue with God about that call that was placed upon him to go and speak to Saul. I would have been nervous about it had I been in his shoes. Saul was notorious. He was on a murderous expedition to try and kill, maim and harm as many Christians as possible. And God was asking Ananias to go and see him without Ananias knowing that anything amazing had happened to Saul in the previous few days. So why not be nervous? I'd have been nervous, and I'm sure you would have been nervous if you'd been put in that situation. God doesn't get immediately cross, so to speak, with Ananias, but he does get firm with him. He goes on, the Lord said to Ananias, go, but then he gives him some reasons. This man, Saul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And he did suffer. Paul's life was never easy when he came into God's service. So Ananias enters into a discussion. He enters into prayer because effectively that's what praying is. Praying is just talking. It's a conversation with God. It's simple. Prayer is not meant to be complex. It's not meant to be tied up with lots of fancy language. Prayer is just having a relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. So Ananias talks to God, prays to God, gets a further response. And God is basically just trying to give Ananias some reassurance that you did hear me right the first time. I do want you to go and see Saul because something incredible is going to happen. But I need you, I need you to be involved in it. Are you good at listening? My wife tells me I'm rubbish at listening, especially when the dishwasher needs stacking, apparently. She says, I never hear that. She laughed the other day because she said she smoked very low, very quietly when she was baking a cake and said, do you want to come and lick the bowl out? And apparently I heard that very clearly. So it's just funny how uh, you hear different things. I don't know what you like. I don't know what you like when it comes to listening, but I'm not a great listener but it is something we need to do. God can speak to us, perhaps in unexpected ways, perhaps in, in unsurprising circumstances. We need to just attune ourselves to be able to hear God speaking to us. Then finally, we have a choice. If we've listened and we've heard what God said, we have a choice. We can either respond and do what God says or we could ignore it and go a different way. Do you know, it is right, I think it's 100% right that we test out what we think God has said to us. In a sense, that's what Ananias was doing when he entered into that dialogue of prayer. We need to be asking ourselves, does what I am being asked comply with my understanding of the whole picture of life outlined in Scripture? We need to pray that we're hearing God's call correctly. It may be appropriate to share something of that call with other people, other leaders in the church. If God puts something on your heart to do in this fellowship, it would be right to go and talk to Mary about it. Not to just go and do it. Talk to her. See if it resonates with other Christian people, other leaders in the life of the church. There have over the years been some quite dreadful things done in the name of God with people supposedly responding 
to what they believed was God's call on their life. God will never get us to do stuff which is contrary to what he has put in his word. Ananias, at the end of this story, responds. He chooses to do what God says. It doesn't say whether he went into the house with great confidence or whether he walked in in fear and trembling. I actually get the impression that he probably, by this time, was relatively confident that God had spoken to him and he was responding properly to that call. And I'm encouraged that he went in there and the very first words he says were brother Saul. Have you noticed that? He says brother Saul. He has actually believed before he'd met him that God had done something amazing in his life. He took God on his word that this man was going to do something incredible. He was going to be a, an instrument to reach out to the Gentiles. And he believed God and he took him at his word. So he greeted him with that word brother. Something that made Saul feel immediately accepted by somebody that he'd never met before and by a group of people who were most of the time completely fearful of Saul. Takes the heat out of the situation beautifully. Brother Saul, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me. What amazing thing. Jesus sent Ananias. Why did he send Ananias? Why didn't he send Peter or one of the other big names? He didn't. He sent Ananias. And the challenge to us all this morning is, are you another Ananias? None of us are big names. None of us are multi you know, we're not media stars, we're not big names in the church, we're not even big names in the Methodist church, we're just little ordinary people. And yet God can take ordinary people and give them an incredibly powerful mission to fulfil. And you know, God can take any of you this morning and give you a really powerful mission to fulfill. It's just a question, are we ready to listen and be willing to respond? Ananias only gets mentioned once more in scripture after this story. But it's Paul, Saul changes his name if you remember to Paul later in Acts, and it's Paul that recalls this encounter when he's giving his testimony of faith. And he says this, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law, highly respected by all the Jews. He stood beside me and he said, brother Saul. Interesting, he remembered, he said, brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then he baptised him. Ananias actually baptised Paul. The little, the insignificant, he sunk away, went back and did whatever he was doing in that local church. I'm sure he was important, but he wasn't important enough to appear again in our scriptures. But for that particular moment, God was able to take him and to use him in an amazing way. I want to finish off by just telling you this story about a man called Albert McMakin. Albert McMakin was a, um, a farm worker and a Christian. 
and he was desperate, as a lot of young people were, to share his faith with other people. He wanted more and more people to become Christians and a mission, a tented mission, this is back in the 1930s I think, a tented mission had appeared in a nearby town and he arranged for some of his friends to go to that mission. But there was one particular lad who he really wanted to go and this bloke just would not go. So after a few days of trying, Albert used a different tactic. He turned to his friend and he said, would you drive my truck tonight and take the people that I've invited to go to this mission? Now this other man really liked driving and that was the trigger. And he said, yeah, okay, I'm not doing anything this evening. I'll drive your truck and take people to this tented mission. And that bloke not only took people, but he also snuck in at the back and he listened to what was being said on that occasion. That particular man gave his heart to Jesus that night and his name was Billy Graham. How many people have ever heard of Albert McMakin? Not many. Millions of people have heard of Billy Graham because Billy Graham was probably the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. But Albert responded to God's call. Albert wanted to see his friends come and hear a mission speaker. And he did all he could to get people there. So what is God saying to you this morning? What can you do? How can you respond to God's call? We're not all called to be preachers. We're not all called to be church leaders. We are all called to be in service of our God. Please listen to what God is saying to you. Find your place in serving God within this fellowship, within this community. Listen to what God is saying, work it through, and then respond and be able to be used. You never know what your impact could be through being obedient to the call of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this simple story of Ananias. Thank you for his willingness to respond to you. And thank you that through him, one of the great apostles, one of the great church builders was launched into ministry. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to hear you speak into our lives and that we would have the courage and the confidence to respond to your call and to do your will in this place and beyond. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've chosen a traditional old hymn to finish this morning. I couldn't think of anything better than this hymn, O Jesus, I have promised. Right at the end, in verse 5, it has these words, O guide me, call me, draw me, uphold me to the end. I pray that as you listen to this being sung, you recognise that God has a plan and a purpose for you that is good and he really wants you to fulfil it to his glory. Let's enjoy this hymn together.
so we come to the end of our time together let's uh, let's just pray and bless each other as we make our way father we thank you for this time we've spent in your presence this morning we do pray that we would listen to your voice and respond to your call and now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.